up, right, in order to get positive volume. So it says you need to find the one on the top, you need to find the one on the bottom. That way, when you do subtract them, as Sarah said correctly, when you subtract them correctly, you get the right answer. We need to know which one of these is our f of x and which one is our g of x. That way, you set a problem right. So how would you do that? Not quite, because I'm already giving you the interval. You're making it harder than it is. If you set them equal to each other, you're going to if you set them equal to each other, you're going to find the places where they intersect. If they do intersect, these don't intersect. I don't think they intersect. Someone do the math real quick in your head. I believe they don't. Uh, but x squared plus one half that goes like this, x goes like this. They're not going to intersect. Okay, so even if you set them equal to each other, you get x squared. Oh, what do they do? Minus x. Don't know. I don't really care. But no, that's not the way you yeah, do. Do they really? Because mm -hmm. you have one f right there. X. Is gonna Let's go. see. I gotta see. <laughs> wow. I gotta see. No, they do not intersect. Discriminant tells us that. You get b squared minus 4ac, that's negative, true? So b squared minus 4ac is negative, that means you do not have a solution for a quadratic formula, which means these things cannot, it cannot accept, intersect in real numbers. Therefore, no, these don't intersect. Shame on you people for saying yes, <laughs> they do. Not shame on you, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but no, they don't intersect, but that's what that would be t doing for you. So if you set them equal to each other, you're going about it the wrong way. That's too much work for this problem. Again, you'd be making it harder than it needs to be. This is not hard to set this thing up. All you need to do is figure out what's on top for the given interval. How do you figure what's on top for the, ah, I gave you the interval. If I didn't give you the interval, that's when you would set them equal. That's when you solve to see where they intersect. You, you get me on that? So what do you do here? Plug in the number. Yeah, one's always going to be on the top of, each, of another one. That you might check by, let's see if they do intersect. Send them equal to each other. Do they cross over? That's what that would do for that interval. Here, I'm just telling you, and I told you already, this one is going to be one function, this one's going to be another one. One's already going to be on top of the other for the entire segment. So between zero and two, one's on top. Otherwise, I would have worded it a little bit differently. So if one's always on the top, plug in a number. What number are you going to plug in? One. I pick something in the middle of it. One. I don't, doesn't really matter. But plug in one. If you plug in one here, you're going to get one and a half. If you plug in one here, you're going to get which one's higher? So this is going to be higher than this one, right? It's always on the top. I drew the picture for you, but that allows you to set up even without a picture. Can you tell me where we start on this? Where do you end? What are we going to have in here? Good, pi. Then a big old bracket, because we're going to have a couple functions being squared in there. And that, that pi, we can even pull that out of our integral if you'd like to. It's a constant. It can do that. What goes on the inside first? Tell me, tell me first. OK, good. What are you going to do with that function? Then what are you going to do? Uh -huh. Subtract what now? Now I'm going to put it in a bracket just so you see that this is the second function. So notation-wise, I want to want to be consistent. Let's see if we can get it. We've got our, our formula here, which says you have the pi, no problem. That's going to give us the well, that's basically our formula from area to circle. We have the outer disk minus the inner disk, but we got to square them because they're the radius squared. How many will feel okay setting that problem? Did you feel comfortable this side? Do you guys feel alright with that? Did you feel comfortable getting that this one was on the top of our g of x? This one's first, this one's second. Now what? Probably. Go for it. See if you can foil that out.
So folding all that out, if you do in your head, great. If you want to write the side, great. Just get the right, get the right answer. Make sure you fold it correctly. Uh, this is going to be one fourth plus x squared plus x to the fourth, and then you have this minus x squared. I would like to know if you got the same thing on your paper that I got on my paper. Did you get the same thing? Yes, no? Good. Oh, okay, good. What happens here? Which is kind of nice. You see, the thing about it, you could do this two different ways if you really thought about it. You could find out the volume of f of x and find the volume of g of x and just subtract them, couldn't you? Which, that's another way to derive this formula, by the way. It's the same exact thing. You'd have the same bounds, right? Put them together. It'd be subtracting integrals between the same bounds with the common pi. You'd factor the pi. Same thing. You could do it. However, you're creating more work because when you do an integral of f of x, or the area of f of x, and do the integral of the area of g of x, you're doing two different integrals and, and doing all the bounds when sometimes you get this situation where you can combine like terms. Sometimes things go away. So it's nice to do this rather than two separate integrals. Do one larger integral. You seeing the point on that? That's why I give it to you this way. So x squared is gone. Love that. <coughs> What do you say we pull that pi out? We got 0 to 2, 1 fourth plus x to the fourth dx. The pi is going to stay there. Can you take your integral of 1 fourth plus x to the fourth? What are we going to get? <coughs> say what now? 4x. OK, x to the fourth, that's great. 1 fourth x, does it really matter? It does need to be in parentheses, though. It has to have a bracket. Plus what? And we'll be evaluating that from 0 to 2. So I'll have my pi out there. I'm going to do 2 over 4. Plus 2 to the fifth over 5. And then I'll subtract, but when you plug in 0, you're going to get 0. So I'm just going to show it this way, just to make sure I don't have anything wacky going on with that 0. Make sure I have it up there. That's going to be our, our volume when we multiply by 5. So 1 half plus 32 over 5. to do that for you, but 69 pi, don't forget the pi, 69 pi over 10. What did we just find? It's kind of cool. We actually find the, the volume of some solid, whatever it was, as long as you know the function on the top and the bottom, some solid revolved around the x-axis. That we found out how much, if you were going to pour this out of concrete, how much concrete you need. 69 pi over 10 yards or feet or whatever, cubic feet, I suppose. Oh, I'm to place that order. <laughs> Right. Yes, hello, I need uh, 69 pi over 10 yards of concrete. Yeah. Oh. Unless you know Scott is like, you got it, son. I got that. <laughs> yeah. You got it. Son. See? See? Have you you contractors might know how to do that. Have you the concrete contractor ever. How many understood this example feel okay about it? Now, can you do this when we revolve around the Y? We've been going around the X the whole time. Can you do it this way? Well, I hope so. The ideas aren't going to change. It just says what happens if you have a figure going up and down rather than left and right. And the formulas will be very similar. The only difference will be, well, of course, the, the variables will be slightly different. Yeah, you can really so let's talk about volumes that are perpendicular where the, I'm sorry, where the planes of the interval are perpendicular to the y-axis. So volumes where the cross-section is perpendicular to the y-axis. 
Before we had the cross section perpendicular to the x axis, that's why we were able to take and make all those little discs out of it. Here we got this way. Well, if we, if we talk about it, the disc method then would end up looking like this. Instead of from A to B, we usually use from C to D for the y axis. So we go from C to D, we'd have some area function. But the area function is still going to be a circle. Pi r squared dy. Where u of y would be your function in terms of y, not in terms of x. Where u of y would be your function in terms of y, hence the y, instead of x. That's the idea for the disks. For the washers, very, very similar. Still from c to d. Still a pi. Still the radius squared, some outside function, minus some inside function. Squared. Hopefully it looks familiar to you. It's basically the same exact idea, only you're going the y axis to the x. I'd like to give you an example if you don't mind on this. Would you like to see one? Sure. Now the process won't be any different, it really won't. Just have different variables. But this stems from, from this idea. What if you were to take... By the way, I only know how to draw one function like this, so that's why I do the same one over and over. I took it and went that way basically, if this is u of y, then the solid would look like this. not in proportion, but hopefully you get the idea. We're just going this way with it. Taking this solid. Rotating it around the y-axis, we'll get that sort of shape. Notice how we're perpendicular to the y. All the cross sections will be perpendicular to the y. That means we can integrate from, instead of a to b, we usually call it, again, c to d. We can still integrate from c to d. <coughs> add up all those cross sections basically. Let's try, let's do, I'd like to give you several examples on this. So I don't know if we'll finish this today, but I do want you to see a lot of them uh, so you get kind of a handle on it. So we'll start kind of nice and easy and work our way up from there. So let's say this. y equals the square root of x is revolved around the y-axis. <coughs> and it's bound by y equals 2 and y equals 0. 